In this video I'll be showing you how to build your very own PC case from the ground up using nothing but cheap materials and basic hand tools. Let's get to it! Above everything else, the case's primary goal is to be easy to construct. This has resulted in a design that's rather unusual in the fact that all of the components are mounted to a base plate onto which you can easily slide the outer shell. This allows you to experiment with different looks as you can change its appearance entirely without having to start from scratch each time. The structure of the case is made out of 6mm thick fibre board known as MDF. It's an easy material to work with using hand tools, which is why it's been chosen for this build. To make things even easier, the case is available in kit form. More details about that in just a minute. So the first thing to do is make the base platform. In the description you can find some templates for this, which need to be printed out onto A4 sized paper, which can then be stuck to pieces of MDF of the same dimensions. All of the mounting holes are marked on these, and a key is provided for the correct sizes. You'll also notice outlines for the various cutouts and vents, and to cut along these we'll need the single most important tool in this entire build, which is the humble coping saw. Coping saws have removable blades, which allows them to be threaded through holes and then used to cut out shapes. The trick is to remove chunks bit by bit by taking the blade to the corners first and then pulling back to start at it from a different angle. If you don't fancy doing all of this manual cutting however, or want precisely cut panels, this project, as I mentioned earlier, is available in kit form. These are far more accurately cut than what you could do by hand, as they've been milled with a CNC, which results in neater edges and a more exact fit. Also included are all of the screws and mounting hardware that you'll need, so you can literally get building right away. For the rest of the build I'm actually going to be using one of these kits, but don't let that lessen the fact that you can do this build and do it well using hand tools. The option of the kit is there if you want it, and you can find a link to it in the description. It's on the brand new DIY Perks website too, so uh, worth checking out. So once you've made, or received, the panels, the two base panels can be screwed together with right angle brackets. Note that the one on the left needs two washers behind it, which creates a gap for the graphics card to slide into later. Now we can add some 25mm long PCB pillars for the motherboard to sit on, and also some feet, which are just M6 bolts, although a good alternative would be to use speaker spikes. They're quite expensive, but do look quite nice, so I'll be adding these in later. So that's the base itself completed, and the next thing to tackle is the outer shell, the making of which is just as easy. It consists of two sides, a front, and a top, and fitting them together is just a case of using some right angle brackets and some very short self-tapping screws. When you're done, the edges are unlikely to be perfectly flush, so slightly loosen the screws and adjust them to be as close as possible. It still might not be perfect, but we'll be using some sandpaper later to make it super smooth. So that this shell can be screwed securely to the base platform, we need to get three brackets and glue in place a nut onto each, being careful not to get any on the inside of the nut itself. One can then be screwed to the front of the shell, and the other two to the back. The one at the front provides an anchor point at the front of the case, which can be screwed in at the bottom, while the other two clamp the whole thing in place. Optionally, you could add two more brackets to the sides of the base plate as shown here, but doing so would mean that the screws would be visible on the sides, which, depending on your design, might not be desired. Still, the option is there if you need it, and it would keep the sides clamped down very securely. So that is how it all fits together, and now the fun can really begin, as it's time to make this thing look good. So the first thing we'll tackle is the base platform, and the first thing to do is seal the panels with a mix of PVA and water. <laughs> Note that when I recorded these steps, I used the prototype version of the project, so you may notice a few minor changes in the panel design. So to give me a really cool industrial look, I'm going to use some carbon fibre effect vinyl wrap. After painting in the edges of the panels black, this vinyl can be stuck to the surface and trimmed around the edges. Once the panels are screwed back together, it looks really good, and you could almost forget that it's actually made out of fibre board. Here you can see that I've used those speaker spikes I mentioned earlier, and they look great. 
So now it's time to add the computer components. Mine have been very kindly provided by Reichelt.co.uk, who are an electronics retailer with a huge catalogue of products, many up to 20% cheaper than elsewhere in the UK. They seem to sell literally everything, so are a perfect one-stop shop for project builds. You can find a link to them in the description. The first thing to fit is the motherboard. This needs to be an ITX sized board, which is the smallest format you can buy. You can still build a very high-end PC around these smaller boards, as they have very few compromises over larger ones these days. For example, this one even has an M.2 slot on the back, allowing the storage drive to be mounted to the motherboard itself, saving space and keeping things neat and tidy. So after the processor has been installed, the RAM 2 can be slotted in place, and then the cooler added. As you can see, this is a particularly large cooler, one of the largest you can buy in fact, which demonstrates that, apart from the motherboard, full-sized components can still be used in the case despite its smaller internal volume. Now, before fitting this to the base, any storage drives need to be screwed in place first, as these reside underneath the motherboard. You'll need to use at least two washers to raise the drives up slightly though, so that the connectors won't be bent upwards, but there's still plenty of room for the motherboard thanks to the tall standoffs. There are mounting holes for two drives here, but as my drive is on the motherboard itself, I won't be utilising either of them. So after the motherboard has been screwed in place, we can add the power supply, which can again be a full-sized unit. It's important not to use a cheapo power supply though, as reliability is important for the rest of the system. I'm using a 500 watt unit from Superflower that features platinum grade efficiency, allowing it to be completely fanless and therefore silent. It's a great unit which was kindly provided by Overclockers UK and you can find a link to it in the description. Before mounting it however, we need to, at this point, plug in any cables, as it will be difficult to do so afterwards. This includes extending any motherboard headers that you want to use. I'm going to use a little extender for the power button, and also an extender for the front panel USB ports. Looking good! As the power supply faces downwards, we'll need to use a right angle plug to later hook it up to the mains. Now the last component to add is the graphics card. The one I'm using is a very large full length desktop card, but again it still fits with room to spare. Not bad at all for a compact case. Its steel backplate should slide down behind the bracket I mentioned earlier, which clamps it at the bottom, and the top can be simply held in place with a cable tie. This is actually surprisingly sturdy. So that's the base completed, and it's looking great! Now it's time to tackle the outer shell. The design of this is largely up to you, and I do encourage you to experiment with your own ideas here, but I will show you what I did for mine just to start you off. The first thing to do is to cut out various holes in the side panels according to your desired design and fit them together. If you use wood glue like I did here, don't forget to slide it over the base before the glue dries just to make sure you've not made it too tight. As you can see I've added a hole for the power button, a cutout vent for the graphics card, and some holes for the USB ports. Now it's important to sand down the edges once the glue's dried, so that it's all nice and flat along the joins. This is because the vinyl wrap shows up imperfections quite easily, so it's worth spending a little time here as it will look much better later. Now for my design I want to have a different texture look running down towards the power button. As vinyl wrap doesn't look particularly good when just buttered together, I used a saw to cut a shallow groove to act as a separator. You'll see what effect this has in just a sec. Just as before, the MDF can be sealed with a mix of PVA and water, and then the edge is painted. The vinyl wrap can now be added, and pushed into the grooves. You may want to use a hairdryer to soften it up so that it adheres more securely. This is particularly important for curved edges, as it actually makes it elastic enough to stretch around some quite tight curves for a really super looking finish. I'm using a brushed aluminium effect vinyl for the stripe, which looks surprisingly convincing and goes nicely with the power button I'm using. This needs to be a momentary button, rather than a latching one, so that it only makes a circuit when pushed. However, before inserting it, we need to add a little pin connector so that we can hook it up to the power button extension we added earlier. The USB header ports can at this point also be added. So to finish off the divide between the two vinyl textures, we have a few different options. 
If you want a simple clean divide, you can insert a piece of wire or elastic into the gap. But we can do one better and make an awesome looking glowing rim by using some flexible electroluminescent wire, known as EL wire. This stuff is available in different colours and is surprisingly cheap. I've put a link to some in the description. Mounting it is just a case of using a small amount of glue to stick it onto the groove. Mine was slightly too large to fit fully inside, but that's okay as it actually looks better when slightly proud, as it can still be seen when viewed from the side. If you have any left over at where you want them to finish, it can just be cut down to size. So the last thing to do is mount the driver that powers this EL wire. This runs off 12 volts, so I'm going to hook it up to the power supply's 12 volt output by sacrificing one of its modular cables. I also had this go to three power jacks on the back so that I can power 12 volt devices directly from the PC, like my monitor and RGB lights in my DIY headphone stand. However, as this driver emits quite an annoying high pitched mosquito whine, I boxed it inside a little enclosure to silence it. With that done, all of the various connectors can be plugged in, and then the shell slid in place and screwed down. Now for the grand switch on. So as you can see, it looks absolutely great, and at this point you should give yourself a pat on the back, because you've just made something unique that you can call your very own. The only limit on what you can make is your own imagination, as you can experiment with different vinyl wrap textures, different colours, you could paint it, you could have different shaped cutouts, literally go wild, this is part of the fun of this project. You could even make a shell out of aluminium, which is certainly a head turner thanks to its retro looks. So how are temperatures on this thing? Well, as the graphics card has an intake vent right next to it, its temperatures are very low under heavy load. In fact, the card is cooler with the case closed than when it's run in the open air. This is down to the rear fan helping to pull the air through, as there are no other intake vents in my particular design. Now, the CPU temperatures were about 5 Celsius hotter with the case closed, which is still pretty good going. If you want to prioritise cooling, however, you could always include an intake vent right next to the CPU cooler, which should improve things even more. So that's it for this video. Uh, don't forget that this project is available in kit form, a link to which you can find in the description. It's much easier and quicker to put together than if you were you know, cutting it out by yourself. And you get all of the screws and mounting hardware, standoffs and nuts and bolts even the washers, you get everything. Um, so you can just put it together and put your components in after you've added the vinyl or painted it or whatever you want to do. So you've got complete creative freedom over the final look of the case. It just takes care of the hard bits which are making the panels themselves. Um, so let me know if you'd like to see more of my projects in kit form. Uh, it's a bit of an experiment to see whether you guys are interested, so uh, do show your support if you are. And uh, other than that, I'm Matt, you've been watching DIY Perks, and I hope I see you next time. Goodbye for now. P.S. The last PC case I made out of wood had one consistent comment, which was that it was allegedly a fire hazard. So to debunk this, I used a FLIR 1 thermal camera to check the maximum temperature the MDF got to, and it was about 40 degrees Celsius. This is about the same temperature as your hand after doing the washing up, and a far cry from the 200 degrees Celsius required for MDF to spontaneously combust. So with that, I bid you adieu.